many of you perhaps this time of year are harvesting something from your garden this month. And after all your hard work, tilling the soil, adding fertilizer, planting seeds or vegetable plants, you know, and there's also watering and pulling weeds and fighting off the rabbits, the woodchucks, the crows, the deers, and the occasional neighbor or two from getting in your prized zucchinis. Yes, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Tis the season, right, for the zucchini. You know who you are. Raising those zucchinis like some people raise those prized pumpkins for the fair. Trying to get them as big as you can. And to say to yourself, you know, when you're buying those zucchinis, you know, one pack is probably all that I need. How far could it possibly go? Right? One pack of zucchini seeds or plants. And then when they hatch and they start to grow, they start to take over. Take over your garden, your lawn, your neighbor's lawn. And you know when they start to, to bloom and you start to see that little zucchini, you know that it's just about ripe for eating. You know at a small size, a manageable size. And then you forget about it for a couple days and weeks until it becomes three feet long. And then you come up with an excuse to give it to your neighbor. You know, it feels so natural. So satisfying that you need a pickup truck to deliver a vegetable <laughs> to your friends. Now, while we, uh, Jolene and I didn't get a chance to put in a garden this year, uh, there's a number of other things I'd like to raise uh, that reminds me of this farm to plate mentality, you know, from the soil to the stomach, something natural, something that we can raise with our bare hands. And something that you can raise and you can put on your plate at the end of the year. And I brought some of these things along to show you the things that I like to plant with me uh, that remind me of something that's very natural. You know, pick items from the garden, right from the soil, right to our stomach. And one of those is this. You know, alongside of my corn and potatoes, I like to plant some Smucker's natural jelly, okay? Because it reminds me it's right from the soil to my plate, okay? And hopefully it produces other natural elements. And, and uh, the next one that I do too that, that I really enjoy because it's natural is ketchup. Okay? You know, it's 100% it's natural. You know, maybe I put this in, or next to my beans uh, or asparagus, you know, because at the end of the day, I want to eat something right from the soil. And that's my natural ketchup. And then lastly, the natural item, sometimes... You know, as you're working in the garden, you get really thirsty. And, you know, you could just grab the hose and, and take, it, uh, take a sip, you know, to, to feel refreshed. But, you know, sometimes it's a little early, but I like to wait till it's just right. And I get, and you see, I already drank it. Uh, but my bottle of Snapple, you know, because, again, it's all natural. Right from the soil to my stomach. Now, you might say, you know, Pastor, you know, you know, while the marketing says natural on it, that's not exactly what it means. While they're natural in the sense of packaging, they are really unnatural when it comes straight from the soil. And it's just the way that they pack it, package it, the way they market it, you know, right from the soil to your stomach. Uh, and marketing can help shift our attention to the meaning of words. Uh, it's not natural to find a jar of jelly or a jar of peanut butter or even ketchup growing in your garden. And it's not always natural uh, for growing seasons. It's the same as drought. And today, as we see this uh, passage today, I want us to look for something uh, that God would withhold that's natural so that believers can have an unnatural response to Him as we read this morning. Look with me again at Haggai 1. 1 through 12. We're looking for what is unnatural for what God wants us to do. Again, it says in verse 1, in the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, son of Shutiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. The Lord of hosts said, this people say, the time has not yet come for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. The word of the Lord came through Haggai the prophet 
Is it time for you yourselves to live in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now the Lord of hosts says this, Think carefully about your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never enough to be satisfied. You drink, but never enough to become drunk. You put on clothes, but never have enough to get warm. The wage earner puts his wages into a bag with a hole in it. Verse 7, The Lord of hosts says this, Think carefully about your ways. Go up into the hills, bring down the lumber, and build the house. Then I will be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. You expected much, but then it amounted to little. When you brought the harvest to your house, I ruined it. Why? This is the declaration of the Lord of hosts. Because my house still lies in ruins, while each of you is busy with his own house. So on your account, the skies have withheld the dew and the land its crops. I have summoned a drought on the fields and on the hills, on the grain, new wine, olive oil, and whatever the ground yields on man and beast and all that your hands produce. Verse 12, Then Zerubbabel, son of Shittil, the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and the entire remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him. So the people feared the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, as we again examine this passage, we ask, O oh Lord, that we can too consider our ways like your people here. See that sometimes in life we want to do our own thing, our own trend, seek to satisfy ourselves. And yet, Lord, we see what a neglect your people lived here and not focusing on your temple, your house. Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts today, that we would not neglect the things of you, but that you would put it on our heart that we might live for you your name that I pray. Amen. Last week we started a series in the book of Haggai. we was seeking to answer the question, what does or should satisfy us in our lives? Now there's a lot of things in our world today that seek to be satisfying, and perhaps this is part of the American dream, to find satisfaction in your life, or at the very least, spend your entire life trying to be satisfied. And when we compare ourselves with people around the face of the earth, we begin to realize that we live our entire lives with significantly more than most people in the world. Even some of the uh, poorest uh, of Americans uh, live better lives and have more to their life than many people live around the world. But as Americans today, we often live life unsatisfied, unsatisfied with finances, with careers, with marriage, uh, with family relationships, and even in relation to the church. Again, last week we started this series in the book of Haggai, which at face value is about rebuilding God's temple, which was destroyed some 60 years prior to this. And then God's people, as we know, were taken into captivity because of their sin and rebellion towards God. Now, fast forward 18 years, uh, 18 years before we get to the book of Haggai and the prophet Haggai, we see a king named Cyrus, which we mentioned last week, who was a king of Persia, and he rose to power, and ironically, he feared God, and he let God's people return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. This is around the book of Ezra. Now, this is good news for God's people, but God's people needed to be motivated as well. They needed a call from God to help jumpstart this project. Uh, not just putting back their lives together, but getting their worship of God back on track. And this, again, this is a lot of where the book of Ezra comes in discussion. So we read in Ezra chapter 1, verse 2, says, this is what King Cyrus of Persia says, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem in Judah. And then we go on to verse 5 of Ezra chapter 1, which says, So the family leaders of Judah and Benjamin, 
along with the priests and the Levites, everyone God had motivated prepared to go up and rebuild the Lord's house in Jerusalem. So early on in the book of Ezra, we have the instruction. Uh, we have the preparation to go and rebuild God's house. The freedom given from King Cyrus of Persia uh, for the people to return and rebuild God's temple in Jerusalem that we remember as was destroyed in 586. But then we uh, fast forward a little bit to Ezra chapter 3, which tells us that they began, to, once they began to get settled in, that Joshua, son of Jehozadak, built an altar and offered burnt offerings to the Lord. And they continued to give these offerings day by day. And the work on the temple actually began and the foundation got completed. And we read in Ezra 3, 16 through 17, it says this. It says, when the builders had laid the foundation of the Lord's temple, the priests dressed in their robes and holding trumpets and the Levites descended from Asaph holding cymbals, descendants from Asaph holding cymbals, took their positions and praised the Lord as King David of Israel had instructed. They sang with praise and gave thanksgiving to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love to Israel endures forever. Then all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because of the foundation of the Lord's house had been laid. But then we read in the following verses that not everyone was overjoyed. In verse 12 and 13 of Ezra 3, it says, But many of the older priests, Levites, and family leaders who had seen the first temple, that would be Solomon's temple, wept loudly when they saw the foundation of this house. But many others shouted joyfully. The people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shouting from that of the weeping because the peoples were shouting so loudly and the sound was heard far away. That's Ezra 3. Then as we continue on, it seems like everything is moving forward. We get to chapter 4 of Ezra. You see that this motivation of God's people was short-lived because the enemies of God rose up and they actually tried a new tactic and they asked if they could help build the temple. And the leaders said no. <laughs> we're told in Ezra 4 that the people who were already in the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build, continue to build God's temple. This is kind of like when you're trying something for the first time uh, that you fail and you decide and you vow never to try it again. You know, you're learning to drive as a teenager and you put the car, what you thought in, was in reverse, but actually in drive, and you kind of drove into your parents' garage door. <laughs> Does that mean you just give up driving altogether? No, it just means next time you're going to look and make sure it's in reverse and not in drive. Now, while your parents might revoke your privileges for a while, that means you shouldn't give up. And then according to Ezra 4, the enemies of Judah sought to disrupt God's people, and they sent a letter to the king and asked him to stop order, uh, work order on God's people to stop building the temple. And this is another king. Uh, listened to their advice, and a letter was sent to God's people to stop what they were doing, to stop building the temple. In Ezra 4, 24, we read this. It says, So the work on the temple of God in Jerusalem came to a halt. It remained halted until the second year of the reign of King Darius, of Persia. Ezra 5 picks up where the book of Haggai begins. And it's some 18 years later when God speaks to the people to start rebuilding. And remember last week that God is willing to significantly disrupt our lives if it means that we turn our attention to Him. He's willing to disrupt our lives if it means we turn our attention to Him. Now we read this, we're told as we begin the book of Haggai, this is the second year of King Darius. Uh, and this date actually corresponds to August 29th, 520 BC. 18 years God waited for his people to rebuild the temple. But his people kept neglecting building this temple year after year. You know, just like many of us might neglect a check engine light year after year until our mechanic finally says, no longer. We need to fix this today. God says, we need to fix this. 
to his people. Like we looked at last week, God's people said their response to God is it's not time yet to build God's house. This is a matter of priorities. As someone once said, if something is important to you, you will make time for it. God's people needed to make time for God. They had sidelined God seemingly until perhaps the Dallas Cowboys make it to the big game. (laughs) They are waiting, and they are waiting to build. But God can't wait that long. It's time for you to live in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins. Is it time? He responds. Now here's a stark comparison. You know, if you think about it, they've walked past this foundation week after week. The foundation for God's house that lies in ruins. Week after week, month after month, while in the same building their own house perhaps even in luxury. At the very least, they have a roof over their shoulders while God's house is out there, barely a foundation, perhaps a pile of rummage through material. Verse 5 through 8 of chapter 1 of Haggai remind us of what God has done to get their attention and that they need to make things right moving forward. First, Notice the repeated phrases that we talked about last week, which was, think carefully about your ways. You know, God's uh, people could point the finger and say, well, our enemies, they need to think about their ways, what they've done before God. How could they? Or perhaps they look at their neighbors and say, look what they've done. They're just not walking closer to God. But God doesn't point the finger at their enemies or even their neighbors. He says, consider your ways. Consider your ways. Often we point the finger at younger people for the choices they make. And yes, maybe they're logical, perhaps counterintuitive. But if we were to engage the text first, it says it reminds us to remember our ways. Consider your ways. God doesn't call them to change anything before He calls them to think about what they've done. How did we get here? Now, perhaps your life is not where you think it should be today. You know, you thought you would retire at 65, but your financial advisor keeps saying 105. You thought you'd be in great shape by now, but the doctor just keeps scratching his head. You thought you would be relying upon your kids to take care of you. Your kids are still relying upon you and, and even their kids and their kids' kids. <laughs> we feel unsatisfied with our lives. But we can consider our ways and ask God, are they your ways? And if not, why not? Consider our ways. Last week we touched on some of the things that God has done to make their lives very uncomfortable. And what's found in verse 5 and 6. And he tells them after consider their ways, he says five things. He says, you plant, but harvest little. You eat, but are never satisfied. You drink, but not enough to become drunk. You put clothes on, but never enough to get warm. And lastly, you earn wages, but you put them in a bag with a hole in it. In other words, as one version says, look what is happening to you. Look, though, again, we see God's call to action then. As he says, again, consider your ways. Look at God's fivefold response in verses 7 through 8, where he says, go to the hills, bring down lumber, build the house. Then I will be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. Now, words are easier said than done. Bring down lumber sounds fun. Until you have to go into the woods, go up in the hill and find the right tree. You have to cut it down. You have to debark it, cut it into manageable size, and then transport it to the temple foundation. All without a steel chainsaw or wood miser sawmill. This is a tall order here. Go, bring, build. Then 
God will be pleased and glorified. But oftentimes we make pleasing God a lot harder than it has to be. Sometimes we think that God wants us to jump through a flaming hoop, uh, juggle chainsaws, be a snake handler, to be a Christian. You might know the name John Piper, who's devoted much of his life to helping people understand the pleasure of God when he says a very popular statement he's made that God is most glorified in us when we are most uh, satisfied in him. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. So here God's God wants his people to follow his instruction and rebuild the temple. Why? Why? Because their relationship with him depends on it. It demonstrates their priority. And one scholar noted that the same word is used when describing their harvest with what God is telling them to do. That the same word is used for them harvesting what they planted and then uh, then bringing the lumber down from the mountain. So what's the point of this? Is that as the people are hearing the word from the Lord, the same word is used and sounds the same to them. As he says, uh, this is your harvest and now bring down this lumber. The people would know and hear and take note uh, that what got them into the mess to begin with is what God is going to use to help them get out of that. The same word of the harvest of what got them into the mess, God is going to say, this is what brings you out of that. All in all, God says, you expected much, but it amounted to little. When you brought the harvest to the house, God says, I ruined it. Why? This is the declaration of the Lord of hosts. He says, because my house still lies in ruins while each of you is busy with his own house. Now, we know that harvest season is an important time of year. It's a compiling of all your hard work, all your time, all your resources, patience or reliance upon God for the proper weather until the time to bring in the harvest. You know, it's no wonder people used to celebrate around the days of harvest a time when you can rejoice about the abundant crop, you know, especially if it was a bountiful harvest. But here, when they bring home the harvest, what should be a joyful time in their lives uh, ends up being nothing. It's destroyed. It should be a joyful time. The harvest is what brings them into the next year. Notice, you know, remember, they depend upon it. Their animals depend on it. Their neighbors depend upon it. Their economy depends on this harvest. Their crop next year depends on the harvest. And what does God do to the harvest? He blows it away. Or in other words, God ruined it. Now, we don't have to wonder why God did this. We don't have to question because he tells them. And that's a key verse in the book of Haggai, is verse 9. Because my house still lies in ruins while each of you is busy with his own house. The Net Bible translates verse 9 as uh, the statement, Because my temple remains in ruins, thanks to each of you favoring his own house. There's a neglect of of priorities with God's people. Now, they're trying to do something good. They're trying to rebuild their lives. Yes, yes. And they were helping each other, trying to reestablish their agriculture and economy. Yes. But did they fix their eyes on the importance of God's home over their own? No. In turn, the temple lies in ruins. It's a neglect of priorities. Now, there's a lot more that could be said here about the relation of the second temple in relation to their uh, relationship with God. But for now, we'll keep it at bay and say that what God desires for His people is this, to stop neglecting my house. Notice the drought in 10 through 11. God says it's on their account that the skies have withheld the dew and the land its crops. He has summoned a drought on the fields and the hills and it will spread to almost every area of life. 
the fields, the hills, the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and whatever the ground yields on man, beast, and what your hands produce. You know, when your cucumbers are not growing very well, you ask your neighbor how their cucumbers are doing. And if their cucumbers are growing okay, you get a little bit worried, but you still sleep at night. But if their cucumbers are not faring too well, and you find out that the lady across town, her cucumbers are not doing well, and everybody in between, their cucumbers are not doing well, you get a little nervous. Well, here it's not just the cucumbers, but everything that comes from the ground. No water, no food. And let go long enough, no life. Drought is tough for us. Not only in living in the West, but also in our own area. While others face a substantial drought in the Western states last year and a little bit this year, we have gotten plenty of water here. And on average, we typically get more of the average rainfall than most areas. You know, rain is our friend some days here in northeastern PA, and other days it's our foes. And kids today, make matters worse, don't often associate where our food comes from. More and more, you ask children where a bottle of milk comes from, and they'll say a container. Or they'll say from the store. When all of us know it comes from almonds. (laughs) Drought, though, to be serious, can be a painful thing on society, and life even depends on it. Many people panic uh, during the pandemic, and they went out and they bought all that toilet paper during the early days of the pandemic. And some of you have not needed to buy toilet paper since. That's a whole other story. But there was a panic, okay, during the pandemic. And drought, though, isn't just about a few rolls of toilet paper. But for them, it's about every item in the grocery store. Almost everything is affected for God's people. This cannot continue or they will not continue. Drought for them is serious. So what's the response to all this of God's people? In verse 12, when they were faced with this drought and an insufficient harvest, what should they do? Well, they could leave. They could just give up, throw in the towel and say, I can't do it anymore. You know, we were better off in Babylon where we were slaves. And others, you know, they built homes there. They settled down. Yes, it wasn't God's desire for them, but neither is starving themselves, their children, their livestock. They could leave. Another option, they could have rebelled. Rebelled against God. You know, they could combine what little resources they have left, continue to be busy with their own homes while God's house is left in ruins. They could continue to struggle through this drought, hoping that there's greener grass on the horizon. Uh, through this drought, this lack of water, lack of produce. They could also demand that God takes care of them and let them do what they want because, again, they are His people. They should be able to do whatever they want to do. But instead of leaving, instead of rebelling, there's a third option, which is always the best option, verse 12, and that is listening listening. And actually, there's a whole lot more here than just listening to the words that come out of your mouth. You know, kind of like some teenagers often do, or your husband might do, or your aging parents might do. It's more than just hearing. It's obeying. Obeying. Verse 12 tells us that Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, Joshua, the high priest, and notice it says all of the people or the remnant of God's people who returned from exile says they obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. There's actually two words kind of wrapped up into one here. It's obeying in the sense of listening. There's a hearing part and also an obeying. One version Use the term, they hearkened 
to the voice of the Lord. Now, it sounds a little archaic. It sounds a little medieval, but they hearken to the words of the Lord. It's not just hearing. It's listening. You know, your mother might have said as a kid, do you hear the words that are coming out of my mouth? And you might say, yes. Then why aren't you doing anything? Why aren't you listening and obeying? We hear a lot of things in life. But we're not always listening to the words of God. But not only is there an obedience through hearing, but there's also a fearing of God in verse 12. They recognize that God has sent Haggai, and we're told in verse 12, because the Lord their God sent him to the people, they feared the Lord. They feared the Lord. The Net Bible says, <coughs> the people began to respect the Lord. When we think of fear in the Bible, we often associate it with our response to the things that we're afraid of. Snakes. Jumping out of an airplane. Things we're afraid of. 1972 Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory movie. <laughs> Just to name a few things. Fear is an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that something is dangerous, painful, or threatening. But in a sense, we're fearful of snakes in a different way that we're fearful of surgery. We're fearful of standing before the Grand Canyon in respect of its beauty, its vastness, in a similar way that we are fearful of God. It's a great and grand respect. There's an awe. There's a sense of fear in correlation to hearing and obeying God. There's at least 40 times in Scripture when we see these two words together, hearing and fearing. Hearing in the sense of obeying and Fearing in the sense of awe of God. Not always in those contexts like that. As in Genesis 3.10, we see the fall of Adam and Eve. Adam's response to God when he's asked, why are you hiding? He said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. Genesis 21.17, and Abraham's wife drove Hagar and Ishmael away from Isaac. Hagar thought her life was coming to an end. And we are told that God is the one who heard the voice of the boy and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what's wrong, Hagar? Don't be afraid. For God has heard the voice of the boy from the place where he is. Isaiah 50, verse 10, Who among you fears the Lord, <coughs> listening to the voice of his servant? Who among you walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of of the Lord. Let him lean on his God. There's a number of verses in Scripture that connect this hearing to fearing in our service of God. And sometimes it's even God who is hearing those who are afraid and in need of help. You see, God's response to him to this drought is listening, heeding to God's instruction to rebuild the temple. God was willing to make their lives miserable if it meant they realigned their priorities to Him and His house. God is willing to unravel our plans if they are not His plans. And again, God is willing to withhold the natural for our unnatural response. In other words, God is willing to withhold what we depend on in life if it means we redirect our attention to Him. Now we need to be careful here. It's easy for us to start walking down a trail and thinking, oh, this is God who's causing something very bad in my life. Causing us to focus on Him. Right after 9-11, and I think I've used this illustration before, Tim Keller gave a sermon called Truth, Tears, Anger, and Grace from the Gospel of John. In that sermon, he addressed the fact that many after 9-11 said it's because of America's sin that God was judging His people through the great tragedy. In turn, then, God is, in a sense, the author of that tragedy 
the author of evil. But Tim Keller says in <coughs> relation to tragedies like this, that is in the case of evil, that one response is to say that God is responsible, that, that He's allowing this evil to happen. But there's also a second response that doesn't look at God as evil, but looks at the enemy at evil. It's the people who did this are evil and demonic. <coughs> Tim Keller looks at the response of Jesus in John 11, 20-53. Sorry, and he realizes that Jesus is not mad at God in the resurrection of Lazarus. He's not even mad at the people around. Or even their response. Instead, he is mad at death, which in turn is a message of the gospel, the grace of God. In the horrific disaster of 9 11, Tim Keller reminded his congregation right after this that there's a sense that something could be greater than it was before in death. It's an opportunity for God to work, for God's grace to shine through the cross of Jesus. But we're also reminded of the words of James to not walk down this path to blame God for what's bad in our lives. James 1, 1, uh, 13 No one is under a trial, should say. I am being tempted by God, for God is not tempted by evil, and He Himself doesn't tempt anyone. So here we see God is withholding what is natural, the dew and the produce from the ground, which are rightfully His. And out of our control, it's in His control. But He's asking for an unnatural response to Him in obedience and fear. You know, rain and harvest are natural to us. So natural that we don't even think about it unless some tragedy happens, something changes. A supply chain shortage, a dry spell, a hurricane or tornado. Then we begin to pay attention to the changing weather. But when God withholds what is naturally His, when He withholds the natural course of life, what is common for us, His natural provisions... Perhaps he's looking for an unnatural response from us. Now, why do I say an unnatural response? Because our natural response to God is rebellion and sin. Romans 3, 10 through 12 says, As is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become useless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Our natural response to God is rebellion, turning away from God. And it takes an unnatural response to turn to Him. A work of the Holy Spirit to turn our attention to God. Even Isaiah 53, 6 reminds us, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to His own way, and the Lord has laid on Him Christ." the iniquity of us all. God often withholds the natural for our unnatural response. And often at times we assume the natural, the common, until God takes it away. Why? Because He wants our priorities to align with His. What are our top priorities in life? And are they God's? Priorities. Are our priorities God's? Let's pray. Gracious Lord, while your people faced a drought until they responded to you, we see that they responded in listening, in obedience and in awe and respect of you. God, sometimes we know that you will withhold what is natural, what is common for us in life, which we feel entitled to, if it means we give and seek you with an unnatural response, obedience, fear, turning to you, being in awe of you. Lord, if you just let the natural way of life go, 
perhaps many of us would never have heard the name of Christ, believed in him, and yet you sent your Holy Spirit to convict us of sin. Turn our eyes towards Christ and believe in him. Lord, in all of eternity, will be changed because of your love for us. Lord, today may we have an unnatural response, heeding to your words and seeking to live for you. Gracious Lord, help us to make your priorities our priorities. It's your name that I pray. Amen. Go in peace.